Boston Road. The special hello goes out to the director of media for the Boston Road alumni. It's the Mark O'Hanlon. I nice see you, Marky. Welcome to the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast, the home of behind-the-scenes interviews, stories, and memories that celebrate the heritage of the great game of hockey. The Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast is hosted by Mark Willand. Rick Smith was one of hockey's steadiest defensemen in the 1970s, and he's our guest on episode 32 of the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast. Rick is a well-spoken and humorous guy, and you'll enjoy his reflections on his fascinating 13-year big league journey. Rick tells about 25 great stories, including joining Bobby Orr and the Big Bad Bruins on their quest for the Stanley Cup in the early 70s, a shocking trade to the California Golden Seals, his amazing stay with the wild Minnesota Fighting Saints of the WHA, and his return to Boston with Don Cherry's Lunch Pail Bruins of the late 1970s. Be sure to subscribe to the PHA Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow us online at ProHockeyAlumni.org and at ProHockeyAlumni on Twitter and Instagram. Of course, WHA fans can also follow us on at WHA Hockey on Facebook, and Bruins fans can check out the official Bruins alumni sites throughout the world of social media. Links to all those are in the show notes. Now, let's talk classic hockey with Rick Smith. We're back on the show with a key figure in 1970s hockey and in all kinds of ways for his days with the Boston Bruins and, of course, in the World Hockey Association with the Fighting Saints, the colorful days with the uh, California Seals, the Lunch Pail Bruins, the Stanley Cups, an interesting guy and uh, an interesting career. Rick Smith, thanks so much for being with us on the show today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Rick, the last time I saw you, uh, we were at the Ace Bailey Foundation dinner, and I was curious if you could tell the fans a little bit um, about Ace and your continued involvement all these years later uh, with his foundation. Wow. I, uh, <laughs> quite a topic to start with. Uh, Ace was just a phenomenal individual, a uh, great teammate, um, but he was the life of the party. Everywhere we went, uh, a party seemed to follow him, or he would create the party. And a uh, very sad thing, obviously, in 2001. Uh, but it really is a, a, a heartwarming story of what's come out of it. Right. And that being the, uh, the Ace Bailey uh, Foundation um, supporting the, um, uh, the floating hospital at New England Medical Center. And in particular, they have a playroom called Ace's Place. Uh, in addition to other things they've done with the neonatal unit and, uh, and, and even putting in a, a playroom in the emergency room at entrance for kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, but a beautiful story. But it, that in, it really embodies Ace in so many ways. Uh, he was, we used to go to the hospital together um, and visit kids uh, in the early 70s. And uh, uh, he, was, he was the life of the, the, the party. And not, well, not so much a party, but they brought so much joy and laughter to the kids and he had a Donald Duck routine and uh, you know I'd just call him kind of follow along behind him as I did in many cases uh, but, uh, um, a phenomenal individual and, and I really believe that in many ways Ace is alive and well uh, every time I go to the floating hospital um, mm. I look around and I can feel him well, absolutely and it's, it says a lot about yourself to uh, you know continue to be so involved and enthused about uh, Ace's foundation um, going forward it was certainly it was a special night it was the first time I had actually attended that event and it was a special night I learned a lot about the floating hospital and look, looking forward to uh, to the next year's event as well um, Rick growing up uh, in Kingston I was curious uh, if like many other uh, young people back then, you had a dream of playing in the National Hockey League growing up. Well, um, not, uh, not really. You know, you kind of uh, thought of it. I mean, not, no, not, I can say no. Uh, I was a pretty average hockey player at best. And uh, I was playing to enjoy myself uh, with my buddies. Uh, it was a social outlet, you know, great exercise sort of thing. But I think they're, they're the right reasons to be playing hockey as a young fella. Um, I think... Um, 
I think you can look too far ahead if you think you're mm-hmm. going to make the NHL and all that sort of thing. I think it's a reasonable goal in general. But uh, I think there are many other aspects of the game that are more important to focus on, as I just mentioned. Uh, and uh, in my case, it's kind of worked out just favorably uh, in some of the uh, oddest circumstances. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I was at 16, you're drafted uh, into the junior league up here. And I was really hesitant to go. I was kind of a shy kid, still am in many ways. But, uh, uh, you know, they kind of talked me into it sort of thing. And I didn't know if I really wanted to do that sort of thing. I was, you know, I was a reasonably good student. So I always had, you know, my parents always uh, emphasized the importance of uh, having your grades up or you weren't weren't allowed to play. Um, But anyway, I I went away to Hamilton, uh, the Red Wings organization, uh, uh, belonging to the junior team, not to Detroit necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, uh, not knowing if I'd make the team and unsure of myself, but uh, there was a great old coach by the name of Rudy Pellis. Uh, he won the, right. the Stanley Cup with Chicago in 61. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he was kind of on the downside of his career. But he came back to junior where he, he that's where he had, had done really well with the St. Catharines. Um, minor or junior team that led to Makita and Hall and all these guys going to Chicago and the Santa Cup. But anyway, Rudy Pillis, for some reason, just was the right guy at the right time. And uh, he kind of, I don't know why he, he did it, but he, he, I think that he had his mind made up uh, at the beginning of training camp that I was going to make the team, even though I was very unsure of myself. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I got through the filter, if you will, right. because of the people above me, the coaches or uh, the scouts or whatever, Sometimes they, 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 it's almost like we think you can, <laughs> even though you right. don't think you can. We think you can. Uh, but that kind of followed through with the Bruins. That uh, I was drafted by the Bruins uh, in a 17-year-old draft. And again, the furthest thing from my mind was playing in the NHL. I was just trying to get through each year playing mm-hmm. junior. Um, had a couple of good years that uh, kind of surprised me. But um, the Bruins, again, they say picked me up. In a, I think it was part of the Leo Boyvin trade. Uh, uh, where I was a, a draft, the extra draft pick thrown in sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But uh, getting to the point, I came to the Bruin camp, and they had suggested that uh, the normal course for a player like myself was to plan on going down to Oklahoma City and you play two or three years there and see how it goes. Right. And from my point of view, that was pretty good. Uh, I was continuing with my education. I'd uh, taken the first year of university in Hamilton and McMaster University, um, with the intent of heading on to dentistry or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was education first, and uh, hockey was just kind of a, an enjoyable thing to do and uh, uh, just nice to be part of the team sort of thing. You know, it's interesting you say that, Rick, because I, my, coincidentally my most recent guest was the Randy Maneri, who uh, reminded me that he, uh, along with yourself and one other player, uh, were, were pursuing their educations while they were playing at Hamilton. And I was curious, playing for Hamilton and balancing the educational requirements, because they were pretty strict, according to Randy. Uh, he had to stay on, on course academically. At the same time, you're just a teenager, and you're balancing playing some, some big-time uh, junior hockey. How challenging was that for you? Um, it was very challenging. Um, and, and funny, I, I appreciate hearing about Randy. We were roommates. Uh, in particular in the year where we went to McMaster. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were the only guys allowed to have a car. Nobody else could have a car because (laughs) we had such a long drive from one side of Hamlin to the other, the university. Uh, But it really was difficult, and uh, there's a lot of travel time. Um, I was in the sciences, so we had chemistry labs, physics labs, all these silly, they're not silly things, but important things. But literally the Hamilton hockey team bus would be waiting outside the lab while I'm finishing up a, an experiment in chemistry, I come out of get on the bus and we go off and play a game. Wow! Now, yeah, it was, and that put a lot of pressure on on both Randy and I because, you know, the team we were getting kind of special consideration from the team, and literally to have the bus waiting for you while you're doing a chemistry experiment <laughs> didn't go over that well. <laughs> you can imagine. Um, uh, consequently, I think that was the third year of my junior career, and uh, my play dipped. Do to just do is trying to do too much sort of thing. Well, you certainly, when you join the Bruins organization, they are on the verge of they're compiling one of the great young teams in the history of hockey. 
In fact, the Oklahoma City uh, Blazer team, you played very little time in the minor leagues. The Oak City team was loaded itself. You know, Jimmy Lorenz and Tom Webster, and you can go on and on. Uh, but you play in the National Hockey League in your first year, the fifth defenseman on the team, but you know, there's injuries of course, so you're you're getting some considerable playing time in that first year. So the the question is, you go to training camp with the Bruins and how are you feeling about things? Was it intimidating? Did you think that you were um, on the verge of or, or ready to play in the National Hockey League? Or as you said, did you think you were looking at a, a few years of seasoning in the minors? Oh, I was in a lay over my head. Um, I was set to go to Oklahoma City. I knew some of the fellows, Tommy Webster and uh, oh, I kind of had asked Steve Atkinson and I played against those fellows. And I was geared for Oklahoma City. There was no question. So every time I, like, I can imagine, or I can remember the first exhibition game I played, I looked around and I went, wait a minute, what am I doing here? <laughs> oh, I guess they do that with the rookies or something like that. Um, and it was a surprise even to be in the game. And I got through the game. Do you know what I mean? Like, my goal is just not to make a fool of myself and fall on my face. So I get through the games in a sense. But, you know, there's a bit of a moral of a story that's jumping in my head right now. And I might jump ahead to uh, a, a story uh, regarding Don Cherry. Mm-hmm. But suffice it to say, when I was on the ice, as quickly as I got the puck, I got rid of it. And that was more out of fear. You know, there was no confidence. It was just, I got, oh, get rid of it, hot, hot potato, get it up. <laughs> And, of course, you get up the forwards. But the, the story that's associated with that is that one year playing for Don Cherry, I had what they call gamekeeper's thumb. And that's the, in the, on, the, um, uh, on your thumb, and if you look between the thumb and the forefinger, there's a ligament that ties the thumb together to the hand, and, and uh, the gamekeeper would be choking chickens. Mm-hmm. So a lot of pressure on the thumb, tear a ligament. Anyway, I had that strange injury. Um, so when it happened, I couldn't move my hand or my hand. Uh, couldn't hold a hockey stick or anything, and they put a cast on it. And I, I, I think they said uh, four to six weeks, something like that, as a ligament would be. But anyway, shortly thereafter, they said, can you try a, just a playing cast? And I thought, you got to be kidding. Mm-hmm. Why would I have a playing cast when <laughs> I need a cast and I can't hold my stick? But sure enough, you, I mean, how do you say no? Of course you... And I think that's the one thing that Don Cherry, when a player would, you know, put himself on the line... That's when he kind of said, hey, I'm with that guy. Right. Uh, and, and in my case, so I'm playing with the, the cast on my hand and thinking, well, this is going to be a short adventure. <laughs> so I got in. But the same thing is tra- at the beginning of training camp. When I had the buck, bing, I got it right up to somebody. Or got it out. You know, so my job didn't, I, I didn't have to be uh, the skilled player like uh, Bobby Orr or Brad Park. All I really were concerned about was the puck getting out of our end. And in fact, as time went on, that's probably what got me through the, my whole career. It's a limited tactic or a limited skill, but puck up over the blue line. That's all that mattered. Um, anyway, when they, my injury was, I'm so happy. I'm going to get my cast off, and I'm just thrilled, right? And Don came to me and said, Rick, I'm not allowing you to take your cast off. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> what do you mean? I've been just scrimping through the game, just barely getting through, and you want me to keep wearing this cast? He says, yeah, I've never seen you play better. <laughs> Isn't that something? That is funny. Yeah. Uh, but um, but, yeah, but uh, to carry back to, to the training camp thing, um, so I got through the games, got through the games, and again, I'm seeing the guys filtering on down to Oklahoma City. They were leaving with their cars and their trailers. Um, and they said to me, okay, Rick, you're going to go to Boston with Bobby Leader, who I had watched him play in Kingston when he was a minor league player with the Kingston Frontenacs. He played for the Bruins. So here I am in this car with a, a veteran player thinking, what are we doing here? And I can remember the drive was down, like we, it seemed to be at night or something, and uh, I'm, I'm, like, I'm in total darkness wondering, where am I going? What am I doing? I had no, <laughs> no plan for this at all. I mm-hmm. wasn't ready. So then we show up at the Madison Hotel. And I, have you ever heard stories of the Madison Hotel? I have not. Well, it was, it was, I think it was the first building I ever saw imploded. Oh. You know, the implosion <laughs> thing? Mm-hmm. And they couldn't do it soon enough. <laughs> it was probably, it was right beside the garden. So we went down the lobby, and then you walked in the North Station. Mm-hmm. And it was a beautiful building on the outside, but inside it was just a wreck. And I think it was kind of like one of those 
it should be demolished buildings, but for some reason they decided to redo two floors in it. I mean, it was probably a 20-story building, but there were two floors that were livable. <laughs> the whole team is in training camp at the Madison Hotel. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking around and going, this is really scary. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, I thought this is going to be a short adventure. But as you say, injuries stepped in. And it was odd as could be that uh, Gary Doak was in particular was hurt. And uh, I think it was a groin that probably took a six-week thing. But even at that, I wasn't the best defenseman to be there. Uh, but another peculiarity, Barry Gibbs, the previous year, who was their number one pick the year I was picked, um, uh, Barry Gibbs had been up the year before, and Barry Gibbs was a, just a heart and soul hockey player, a great mm-hmm. player, mm-hmm. right hand defenseman, and just a tough guy. Everyone knew one a, a number one pick sort of thing, and number one pick overall. So it, sh- it should have been him. But having done it the previous year, and the fifth defenseman basically sat on the bench and watched because they played four defensemen. Right. And every once in a while, if the if there was a if it if it didn't matter that much, they'd throw at the guy to have a just a, a feel for the ice to get credit for the game or whatever it was. Anyway, Gibbsy said, "I'm not doing this. I'm not staying here." So all of a sudden, they you know that was kind of a shock for the Bruins, probably. So he's off to Oklahoma City, and they looked around. And they thought, "Well, gee, we don't really have anybody else we want to do this with." Oh, tell Rick, come on, what the what the heck, you know? <laughs> and that was pretty well. Like, that that story kept going. As I say, we stayed in the Madison for the whole team, and uh, then Jerry Cheevers, and Jerry Cheevers is really the probably the most important character in my whole career. Um, but in particular, uh, Cheesy said to, and Cheesy was. Even in training camp, was really good to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, as long as Eddie, as well as uh, Eddie Johnson, the two goalies were just like godfathers and big brothers and family. But uh, anyway, uh, Cheesy said to uh, Ace Bailey and, and Wayne Cashman, he said, uh, "My the house I'm renting isn't uh, ready to rent yet, and my wife's having a baby. So um, how about we share a, a we we'll get a great big hotel room, a suite up on Route One in Saugus, and." Uh, Cheesy and Cash, Derek Cash, and he says, oh, yeah, gee, that'd be great. Yeah, we'll get out of this hotel, and we'll up there. Oh, yeah, beautiful. So and then they said, well, can we bring Ricky along? <laughs> uh, another f- a very important person in my career was Wayne Cashman. And when he, we're from Kingston, and when it kind of came time for me to my first training camp, Cash called up and said, uh, can I give you a ride to training camp? <laughs> wow, you're not kidding. Because I... I played with his brother, but I didn't really know him. He was an idol, uh, a few years older than I am, and mm-hmm. uh, just a, an idol. So here's this idol saying to me, do you want to ride to training camp? And wow. after that, we get there, and he, he introduced me to everybody as his friend. It wasn't just, here's this guy. Here's, what a difference that makes. Oh, it was enormous. And Cash was always there to protect. But anyway, getting, I could go on and on about Cash for the next hour and a half. But in essence... They, you know, Cash said, well, how about we bring Ricky along? Kind of like bringing along the dog, you know. Like, well, <laughs> hey, we got a dog, you know. So the best part, now we're staying in this uh, place called, uh, oh, some hotel in the, on Route 1. But I figured out why. The next door to the, this particular ho- motel was the Vogue Lounge. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't mean a lot, except it just happened to be Cheesy's favorite bar. Oh. So I didn't really drink. I might have had an occasional beer after uh, a game or whatever. I can remember, and I'm, oh, well, just one beer. No, I can't have more than one beer. Just have one beer. So now all of a sudden I'm with the Bruins, who had definitely more than one beer at a time. <laughs> and uh, we're in this Vogue lounge after practice. The whole team was in there, and they're playing liars poker and, you know, just doing the various things the guys would do in a training camp, uh, bonding, you might say. Anyway, I'm looking around, I'm thinking, holy mackerel. This is kind of scary. Like I had, I had my half a beer, and I, you know, <laughs> what am I going to do? So I said to Cheesy, I said, uh, "When are we leaving?" He said, "We're not." <laughs> <laughs> so that was an education. <laughs> uh, anyway, it was as I say, I was kind of like the. Um, if you're on a train, I was kind of on the top of the caboose. I wasn't right. even in the caboose, you know. <laughs> but the funny thing is, you know, the things you mentioned about Cheesy and uh, Wayne and Wayne, Wayne Cashman and everybody like that, it just always had the impression that 
when it came time to even guys like you who were rookies, they really took you under their wing. The camaraderie on that team, as we talked that that the night that we, we talked a couple weeks ago, it just seemed as a fan from a fan standpoint that camaraderie of the team was very, very strong. Exactly, and it was on and off the ice. And that's the big bad Bruins were, were all around that definition of being together all of the time and taking care of each other. Um, and, you know, Billy Guerin that night at the Ace Bailey dinner talked about family. And it was, it was a, what a great speech. Yeah, sure you was. Know, it la- we had, he was laughing and, and crying at the same time. <laughs> uh, but he talked about going to different teams and how teams would welcome him and make him a part of the team. And, he, like, he talked about his excitement about living next to Paul Coffey. Right. You know, and he, exempl- he exemplified or expressed the feeling that I had to go to a team of, I mean, when, just think of the players on that team. Bobby Orr, as a Cheesy, Pye, Derek, Dallas Smith, Eddie John, all these guys were such incredible heroes to me because I, I mean, obviously I followed the game and uh, just to be a, on the on the ice with them and then off the air in the Vogue Lounge with mm-hmm. them, you know, even though I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was just it was overwhelming, but that sense of family was there at the beginning and has, in my particular case, it's gone on like it was 50 years ago that I was in the Vogue Lounge. Right. Yeah, so, it was. But you know, I saw you, know, you the, I saw you that night when the uh, Hurricanes played the Whalers and you were uh, hur- hur- the Hurricanes played the Bruins in the Whaler uniforms and uh up in the box that night, you're sitting there with Chief, and you were making the rounds. You're up in the jumbotron. It seems like you haven't missed a beat, and uh, you know, for the years in Boston, there's still a strong connection there. Well, that's what I can't get over it. As you say, to to be sitting beside John Busick and watching a hockey game with with my wife, and uh, oh, it, it was a, and, and a, just a side story there. Um, in 1970, we won the cup, and then we all have a ring, a very special ring. And uh, a, a side note even to that is that the ring is a very, I, I don't know how to describe it. It's got a black, a black onyx, onyx or something like that. And inside that is this diamond. And it's a beautiful diamond. I, I, I just think it's a gorgeous ring. But after that, teams got more and more diamonds and left less and less black onyx, if you will. In other words, they got, they expanded. So, that first Stanley Cup ring, the one that I have, uh, from 1970, all the players wear that ring. And in particular, John Busick had that ring on. And, of course, he has three rings. Um, and I looked at his ring, and it's worn. To, like there's a, a, an engraving of the Stanley Cup, or, you know, Stanley Cup and the Bruin emblem and my name and number and, and all, all this stuff. And on mine, it's, I don't wear it that often because... I'm just, I don't wear that. I don't go to that many places where it's appropriate to wear it. But John's is worn so much that half of it was worn away. And I, I couldn't believe it. And I said, John, what happened to your ring? He said, well, I just, I wear it all the time. Well, what a sense of, and I, when, and I, when you tie that together with 50 years ago, you know, yeah, I guess a, a ring would get worn. I never thought that. No, oh, absolutely. That team, as we discussed, uh, was special to the players who played and the people who were around the franchise at the time, of course. But as a kid growing up in Boston, in the Boston area, you that team, I could not explain to people. Right now, the New England Patriots are huge around here, and rightfully so, Tom Brady and everybody. But the Bruins were like that in the early 70s were just uh, the kings of, of Boston, a, a colorful team, a great team, a great personalities. Could you feel that, that, you know, I'm, I'm a fan, I, I, I don't know, but, I was, uh, but I, I'm looking at it, but could you feel that as a player that, uh, while we are, this is really something special here, the bond between uh, the fans and this team? Oh, definitely. Everywhere we went, every game, um and the backdrop to it, I think, is that Boston always had great fans. You know, thirteen nine oh nine. The Bruins were always the favorite, and I, and I got the impression, maybe not true. But I remember hearing people say that when it first started, 
Well, you know, we got the Celtics. They won all the championships and all that sort of thing. But our heart is with the Bruins and the Red Sox as well. Um, so that feeling was from the, from the beginning that I felt. But to see a team grow as it did through the late 60s and have the Stanley Cup win with players, with I mean, when you have Bobby Orr alone, that's worth all of, or that can create all of what was created. But as you say, it was a whole team, and Bobby is the first person to say, wait a minute, it was the Bruin team. When he does things, he's always including the team. Um, so when you when you look beyond to the other players, and Cash, what an incredible player, and it turned out to be, to me, the, one of the greatest captains. Uh, but he was basically kind of like, when you went down the list of guys, it was Bobby and Phil, and then Derek was, you knew, but then their chief, and on and on and on. But the number of players, and with such unique personalities, I, mean, I think of uh, Johnny McKenzie, uh, sadly he passed away, but he and he again he embodied the Bruins. The everybody's in it together. He'd, he'd be the one starting the trouble, but uh, um, and just a, a, a rust robust uh, bang crash, uh, total ton of skill, uh, matched perfectly with Freddie Stanfield and Chief. Um, and then you go down and you look at uh, uh, Derek Sanderson and, and I mean he. All the things he was doing, not all good, and he would agree, but he had the the headlines going. Everybody was, he was the uh, Joe Namath. I'm not having Joe Namath of hockey on your team. But then next to him, there Eddie Westfall, and, and a great player in his own right. 18, everybody called him 18 sort of thing. Uh, but a great player was able to shadow Bobby Hall and do it in such a, uh, um, oh, a sportsmanlike manner. Um and, and look at the goalies. I mean, both Eddie, Eddie and, and Cheesy, and complete personality guys. Like Cheesy would charge out of the players, uh, uh, and, and Eddie was a uh, basically a stand-up goalie. And the uh, you know, I hope Eddie doesn't mind me saying, but we would kind of joke that he'd fo- he'd go out on a, on a on a shooter like a Bobby Hall, and they cut. He was playing the angles, and 99% of the time, Eddie'd win. Mm-hmm. And when it went by him, he'd go over and tap him and tap the guy in the back and say, "Great shot." <laughs> <laughs> but speaking of Bobby Orr, I guess everybody would probably ask you this. But being on the ice with him, um, is there a story or an incident or or something that you can tell us that would just kind of tell us a, a little bit of an inside story about just how head and shoulders he was uh, over the competition in the NHL at that time? You know, the funny part, it's a tough, very difficult question because he was continually, every game, doing something that would just, everybody would be draw, jaws dropped, looking at each other, did you see that? Did you see that? So it's difficult to highlight. Uh, everything he did was so so far above the rest of the players in the league and the, the world. Um, but equally, a gentleman and a, and a great leader, Everything you'd want in a superstar. Easily the greatest hockey player ever. Not a question about it. So and it's like superlative, 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 superlative. So what I think the story that I would prefer to tell is two things. First of all, on Mondays, the optional, uh, we were part of the Black Aces, as I mentioned. I was fifth defenseman and that sort of thing. So the ace and I... And maybe Cash. He didn't. Sometimes he didn't play early. So Donnie Marcotte and maybe a Jimmy Lorenz or a, a, another. So we had four or five guys on the Black Aces. So typically played Sunday night and Monday day. Monday was off day. So uh, except for the Black Aces. So tip, not all the time, but sometimes we'd practice it in Harvard. Uh, but we wrote by van. So Frosty Forrestal would get us all dressed. We'd get ourselves dressed. <laughs> but uh, Frosty would drive us out in the van to Harvard, and we'd go to the rink, and we'd have this little, uh, well, we're here, we're going to, but no coach or anything. Harry, you know, Harry Sinden was our coach. So it was kind of a, an optional, you know, what are you going to do? Well, you better, you better, if you haven't played, you better practice. Um, but we took it pretty easily, because we went out and celebrated on Sunday night, just like the guys that played. <laughs> so, but we were young. But anyway, um, 
Bobby Orr came out with us. Not all the time, but quite a few times. And I can remember looking around thinking, now what are we going to do? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, you're not going to take a day off today, not with Bobby. And he was playing with us, and we'd, we'd typically play shinny or do some kind of uh, drills or whatever. But I, I remember thinking, why is Bobby here? You know, I mean, gee, he's, he played more than anybody. He deserves a day off. And I, I just couldn't figure it out. It turned out later on we found out. He came to make us feel part of the team. Wow. He didn't need to practice. He didn't need that extra time at the rink. He came to make sure we felt part of the team. And to me, that's a giant statement. The other anecdote along that line is that uh, when at the, you know, the, the Bobby's statue at the garden is just, I, I just love it. Every time I go near the garden, I have to go over and I touch it and all that sort of thing, like many other people. But anyway, when it was first, uh, um, you know, dedicated, um, we had shortly thereafter, we were, the team was put in the uh, Boston Sports Hall of Fame, which is a, an incredible honor. And the guys were sitting around the lobby and, uh, what are you going to do today, Dow? So I'm going to go over and see my old friend. Okay, Rick, what are you doing today? Well, I said, uh, I heard there's something over the garden that's worth going over and kind of seeing. And Bobby said, yeah, take a look at the base of the statue. So I had my daughter at, at the function with me, so she and I went over, and we're looking at the statue, and everyone's good and all that, and I'm looking around, I wonder what he meant by this base of the statue. So I went around the statue, and there it is. And, you know, all of the players' names as engraved on the Stanley Cup. I just couldn't believe it. And, again, it came out in the stories that Bobby didn't feel that... Bobby felt funny, I would say, about having a statue that just showed him. So to incorporate the whole team, he had that part on the bottom of the, you know, on the base of the statue, which yeah. is, I've got a picture of it. And it, it, that, to me, that embodies Bobby's, it was a team effort in, in his feelings. And uh, uh, anyway. No, that's an exceptional story. I really wasn't aware of that. I was aware of the statue, not aware of the fact that he included everybody. But again, that would be very typical of everything that you hear. Uh, he scores the goal to beat the St. Louis Blues going back to 1970, and you win the Stanley Cup. I was curious, winning the Stanley Cup, was that, what did you, was that everything you had dreamed it would be? When that, uh, that goal goes in, you're a champion, you're skating around the ice with the Stanley Cup. Uh, was that everything that you thought it would be? Uh, to be honest with you, I hadn't dreamed. I mean, some kind of, I'm sure sometime when you're playing ball hockey and you think you're a star player and you think, wouldn't it be neat? But I never, ever considered it. Um, uh, but the short answer was, it happened so fast, I think we were all surprised. At least I was very surprised. Kind of two parts of the story. Uh, as I talked about it, I was a fifth defenseman and sitting on the bench, kind of, what am I doing here sort of thing, but mm -hmm. enjoying it. <laughs> it was kind of fun. Uh, that was the first year. The second year, again, I was set to go back to Oklahoma City. Uh, again, an injury came up, and it, I think it was Gary Doak again. And I, I'm fifth defenseman. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that was, okay. And then the tragedy with uh, Teddy Green. So in training camp, all of a sudden, one of the four defensemen that played all the time was out for the year. Uh, and that meant Gary Doak, who would be next in line, uh, was playing, and he got hurt. So somewhere in the mid-season, I can't even remember when, all of a sudden, there's, it's me. And I can remember even at that, even though like two players are out of the lineup, I can remember one time in that process that I thought, I might be able to play like, like one of the four. <laughs> and I got the rink and, nope, not the case. They called up the fellow named Jean Gauthier, who was like a 38-year-old guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I thought, who is he? No, I didn't know who he was, but where was, where'd they get him anyway? So he had been in the American Hockey League. But to get back to the story, I, I wasn't playing, but all of a sudden, for some reason, Harry took a chance and played me. And again, a, a little bit of surprise factor, but it seemed to work. Played a few games, and... All of a sudden, I was, I was pretty scared, obviously, or, you know, unsure of myself, at least. But it seemed to work. But it, was, it coincided with the Bruins start of the run for the Cup. You know, it wasn't, it didn't, they didn't, they didn't turn on the switch April 2nd. Right. The team built, and we were in a first-place uh, battle with Chicago. 
and it was it was literally day to day. You don't think about oh, wouldn't it? What do we? When would it be like we won the Stanley Cup? No, it was, can we win tomorrow? Will I be in the lineup tomorrow? Can I mm-hmm. get through my next shift? <laughs> and right. and literally unknown. Um, but the team, and I, I think I got carried along with the momentum of the team and how well they were playing. Um, it, we got into the playoffs, and it was a close uh, series with New York. When you, we were tied 2-2, we had the famous brawl with Derek and mm-hmm. Jacobin and all that sort of thing. Um, but even then, we knew that New York was a heck of a team, and we were fighting for our lives in Game 5. But from that point on, we won 10 in a row. And when you play the Chicago Blackhawks, who had just edged out for first place, you're not thinking beyond the next minute. So to to play in that series against Chicago, um, every game, a, 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 a close game, it could have gone either way, but we ran 10 in a row. That goes pretty quick. And even in the finals, we're playing St. Louis, and we're all kind of looking at each other like, do you believe this? I don't believe this. Can you believe this? And... <laughs> And then it was, I remember that thought going through my head anyway, like, now you can't afford to lose because you beat the best team in hockey. So there was a different pressure that came into the game. But again, the, the team was so good, so much talent. that it. it uh, but even in game four against St. Louis, you know, they, they were winning, right? Right. <laughs> going, oh. right. Uh, but the uh, point is that no looking ahead. It was minute by minute. And, you know, I think it was even in the back of our minds that you could lose an overtime in game four. And fortunately, it was over quickly. That's really the moral of the story is that when we won the Stanley Cup, it just it was so quick. Um, and there wasn't any looking ahead or even appreciating the moment as, as much. And then when we won, it was, it was, there was so much excitement. Um, and it, even it, it just carried over into the next year when the team came back to training camp, kind of still miles in the air, and they just kept rolling through the season. Sure did. The parade was huge. The excitement was unbelievable. And as you noted, the team was just on a roll. The 70-71 Bruins team, as good as any team that's ever skated in the National Hockey League, and uh, a powerhouse, record-breaking season. Espo scores 76. Bobby is better than ever. And you lose in the first round to the Montreal Canadiens and the kid from Cornell University, Ken Dryden. Uh, curious about, I, as a fan, as a young fan, it was the most unbelievable thing that I could never conceive of that the Bruins would actually lose. You know, I didn't know any better because at, at the time we just thought you guys were, <laughs> it was impossible. You just couldn't beat the Brewers. And the uh, the Canadians in a hard-fought seven-game series. The Canadians are a heck of a team. Them, you know, The funny thing is the Canadians had a real good team that year. They probably had seven or eight Hall of Famers on the team. Um, but nonetheless, you lose in seven. What is the feeling among the guys after game seven uh, game seven loss is there a commitment now for the next season? There was just devastation, or uh, what's what's the feel in the locker room? What's the feel among the guys after that type of loss? Well, we were mortified. It was it was a shock. Um, it was surprising, but they, it was a tough fought series. We 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 uh, let's put it this way. Personally, I underestimated them. The team, we'd been going so well for so long um, that it was incon- inconceivable that that could happen. Uh, and, and again, like you mentioned, all the various parts to it, but in particular, Dryden was it, it kind of, and it's hard to speak for the team. I can really only speak for myself, but it was every time he'd say, well, oh, boy, that guy, is ever, he is ever lucky, or, you know, what is this all, where did he come from? And so there's this kind of mystique about it, which probably got into people's heads. But, in fact, he just he just played so well. And I don't know how to explain it, but um, I, I guess I, I don't think our fellows – thought that it could happen because we had played so well and we'd you know, done well against them all a year. Um, but again, as you said earlier, the players they had on the team, 
It was an old John Bellavol. It was an old John Ferguson. It was an old Henri Richard. It was mm-hmm. the old guard. And the goaltending had been poor all season long. So there was no fear going into the series. Um, but those fellows played the, the games of their careers. You know, Red Fisher, the the uh, Montreal writer that mm-hmm. uh, the, the, because I can't remember which paper, but the, um, that was one of the most unbelievable upsets he'd seen in his whole uh, you know uh, career as a writer. You know, following pro hockey, um, it was it was a it was a it was a disaster that you couldn't see coming, except. Everything had gone so well for us so long. So all any team <clears throat> has a time when it doesn't work for you. And um, one way to look at it, and I think I'm choosing to look at it this way, we were, you know, I, it's like winning at uh, blackjack, 23 hands in a row, or for a year and a half we were winning at blackjack. Uh, and it was just our, it was a time when it was rock, scissors, paper you know like it, they they couldn't beat New York we could beat New York and, and all that sort of thing um, but all the worst things circumstances came together um, and even in game seven we we still could have won the game it was a it was a game that uh, I'm sure all of us would love to play again and I, we would love to be able to have a chance to go back and, and make various uh, changes to things that that we did. But um, I think sometimes in life, as I said, it, it was such a, a phenomenal experience that grew to that point. You know, and even, I, we haven't even talked about 1968, but 68 was the beginning of that that team growing. Right. And it had a an above average year. Um, and I, I'm kind of re- digressing a little bit, and I'm, maybe I'm doing it on purpose. <laughs> with the question, but uh, you know, I again, I was again just a fifth defenseman sitting there watching for the most part. But all of a sudden, in '68, playing the Montreal Canadiens, we were two wins away from the Stanley Cup because we played the expansion teams in the third round. So everybody knew the semifinals was the Stanley Cup, and there we were. But we were the underdog. We were the team that didn't know how good we were, and everything everything was getting better, getting better, getting better. So to be that close, again, it, it was a, a a real upswing for the team. And even when we lost, people kind of said, "Well, you know, Montreal was the the best team," and on and on and on. And you know, there was there wasn't any sadness to it. There wasn't. I mean, we were we were disappointed to lose, obviously. But it wasn't a surprise. In other words, we we really hadn't been knocked down. We were beaten, but beaten by a good team, and you could kind of understand. And we were, matter of fact, the the Bruins gave everybody a bonus, which was unheard of. Like we had a playoff bonus, but the Bruins also gave players a bonus above that, depending on you know how much you contributed, sort of thing. But in my case, as a fifth defenseman, not playing. I had a twenty-five hundred dollar bonus, so like I was making twelve thousand, which was far more than I was worth. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> to get a twenty-five hundred dollar bonus, and it was the, the the Adams family were saying, "Look, we're so excited by what you've done and what you've accomplished, how far you've come as a team. We're going to hand out these bonuses." So the point being is that from from my term with the Bruins, 68 to 69, 70, win the Stanley Cup, and then in 70 and 71, go through the league like it was just, it was like water going through paper. It was, there was just, uh, it was, it seemed to be easy, you know. Right. It wasn't easy. It was just such a respect that the team built for itself, and as you say, the community. Everybody was just, we were on fire. And all of a sudden, to, it's almost like a train going down the highway and or the, 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 the train tracks. Everything, we're going straight. We're going fast. And all of a sudden, we got derailed. And you looked right. Well, when you look back and analyze, you could kind of understand it. It's taken a lot of time to understand it. <laughs> but I guess in life, sometimes those things can happen. Absolutely. And maybe that's the best answer I have for you 
uh, with respect to that series. It was heartbreaking. Um, as I say, I think we'd all like to go back and have another chance to play that one over. Right, and it also is a reminder that it was very, very difficult. It is very difficult to win a Stanley Cup. Anything can happen, and uh, uh, there was no no fluke. It was a seven-game series, and the Canadians, of course, went on to win the Stanley Cup. But it's hard to do, and you appreciate it when you have that opportunity. And for yourself, it was one of many opportunities to uh, to win the Stanley Cup. You won it in, in 70. However, as the team gets back on track in 71-72, you are traded uh, in February of that year to the opposite end of the country and the opposite end of the NHL spectrum as far as fan support and the, the overall team to the California Seals. And a, a trade, really, when you look back at it, a trade was good for both teams. The Bruins get Carol Vadney at a time when uh, he helped them win the Stanley Cup and subsequently would help step in uh, a bit when Bobby Orr had knee injuries, et cetera, et cetera. And the Seals, on the other hand, get a tough defenseman, Bob Stewart. They get Reggie Leach, who, of course, would later develop into a 50-60 goal scorer with the Flyers, and they get Rick Smith. So what when you hear about that trade, it's got to be... Now, you're with a team you're very close. It's the only team you play for. You're very close with these these guys. You are un, have unprecedented success. You're on your way to a second Stanley Cup. You can feel that. All of a sudden, it all just stops suddenly. Had you any notion that you may get traded or be involved in such a trade? And what was your reaction when you heard about it? Heartbreaking. And by the way, you put it perfectly. You described the situation ideally. Uh, again, another complete shock. Uh, and as I look back, being a little philosophical, those things happen. Uh, when it happened, it was just, it tore my heart out. I, I remember just uh, incredulous, and it was, I heard about it at 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, you know, we were, they were, I was called down to the lobby of this large motel thing in Oakland, in, uh, in Oakland, and I'm thinking, I think they caught me out for curfew. <laughs> Oops! All right. So I think I'm going down to get uh, chastised for not being in my in the room that I'm supposed to be in. My <laughs> uh, but uh, shock and thinking. Well, and my first reaction was, wait a minute, I, I I'm not going to accept this. I'm just not going to accept it. So I decided to kind of take leave, sort of thing. Um, and I, as I look back on it. I, I should have taken it better. I should have said, okay, look, okay, I got a new team, I got a new job, let's just go and get to, get at it. But in this game, uh, and we had to play the Bruins that night. So I did, I, yeah, well, it, and, and I, I hesitate to tell you that, but I'm going to tell you the story. So being real independent and stubborn sort of thing, I thought, well, I'm not going to accept this. I'm going to rent a car and... I'm going to drive over to Sausalito and sit there at a bar and, and think about it, which was pretty genius on my part, I thought. You know, get away from the problem, think about it. Maybe the beer wasn't a great idea. So sure enough, that's what I did. So I remember sitting at a bar in Sausalito, California, and uh, I was with a friend, a uh, female friend, uh, and uh, I said, I'm not taking this. Just, no, I'm just not going to put up with it. I'm not going to allow that to happen. And for some reason, after a couple of Coors Light, or Coors at the full, I think they went with the high test Coors in those days. But uh, about one o'clock, one thirty, I said, "I'm playing." Now that was probably the dumbest thing I ever did. So sure enough, we go back to Oakland, and uh, they were kind of looking for me. And uh, I said, "Okay, uh, what do I do?" And you know, I had a couple of beers, so you know, fortunately they were they were worn off, sort of thing. Not a brilliant thing to do, I might add. But anyway, I'm going to suit up. And <laughs> all of a sudden, I'm in this room with a bunch of people. I, well, Reggie and, and Bobby, and we're all kind of stunned. Um, but we're going to go out and play the game. And I think the winning goal, when, and we had them like 5-1 or something. Some of the Wayne Carlton got some big goals. and Yeah. And uh, famous story, too, because Bobby came in the room and said, we're not going to allow this to happen. And the the comeback they made was really something, unfortunately. But uh, the winning goal went in off my ass. 
You know, it, it kind of summed up the day. <laughs> it wasn't a very good day. Uh, but after that, it was, it was hard to get my feet in the ground, um, disoriented. But also, there's a heartbreak there. And, and any player that gets traded, unless he's asked to be traded or wants to be, and you know, you, did I have any forewarning? I really didn't. The team was going so well. Uh, it was the team. It was like a. Uh, we described what the what the run up was like uh, in the the derailment in in seventy one. But from the first minute of that seventy one seventy two season, Bobby Orr, especially Bobby, but everyone on the team said we are going to win the Stanley Cup. We're going to take care of what happened last year, and the team just got better and better, and you could feel it. Like like I remember on a bus trip one time and I was happened to be sitting beside Bobby and boy, just, you could just feel it in his voice and it, it meant nothing in the world was going to stop them. So you're really a part of that and you're feeling this incredible momentum and, uh, Oh, pride and all that sort of thing. So to have that, I mean, it was more than just the average trade. It wasn't as though they were, we were going long. We lost 10 in a row and they were looking to, to bring, you know, this was a complete shocker. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 The other really part wouldn't. of it. So go ahead. Uh, yeah. Sorry. The other part, which is uh, somewhat associated, uh, Gary Young was my midget hockey coach, and uh, then he became like a, a scout with the Bruins, and that's why I was drafted by the Boston Bruins because of Gary Young, knowing him from playing minor hockey for him. Uh, so I went to the Bruins camp, and I told you I was fortunate. There were obviously people in my corner. But it probably Gary Young would have been up there with the scouts, and if I did something right, he would have been, you know, saying, "Hey, did you see that?" Right. So, part of maybe why I got to the Bruins was because of Gary Young being in my corner and I was supportive of me. Uh, and we, he was our head, head scout when we won the Stanley Cup, and he drafted players like Reggie Leach and uh, McLeish and all, all these great players, uh, Terry O'Reilly. Um, now Gary is uh, in a real odd case, too, because he loved being with the Bruins, head scout of the Bruins. I, with a, I mean, can you imagine being in that position? But right. money came into play. And I, I don't know how much of the history, you, know, you probably know more about it than I do, really. But anyway, Harry Sinden left the Bruins in 1970 because of he, was, he, he felt that he deserved a, a better contract. And, and, of course, he did. But it was one of those decisions that uh, he wasn't satisfied with the Bruins offer and he chose to leave, which can you imagine that step? That, boy, yeah, that took it, a lot of courage. It's on funny on you mentioned that. I hadn't thought about that in a while. He's at the, he's at the top and he took a job outside of hockey. Yeah. Uh, it's been incredible now that you mention it, but I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. And, go ahead. And, uh, so Gary Young similarly went to the Bruins and said, you know, I feel that I'm worth more money and they didn't agree with him. So that's kind of an awkward position. Now, go figure that Charlie Finley is going to buy a team, you know, the Oakland A's, mm -hmm. and then here's an insurance owner, insurance company owner in Chicago. And I think one of his quotes was, you know, I'm a millionaire in Chicago, but nobody knows me. They all know me now. <laughs> when he buys the Oakland, the Oakland Athletics uh, and all the various things that he introduced, and, and some of them you got to give him credit for but anyway, for him to buy the California Golden Seals, well, go figure. Why? It, to me, it was a, an ego thing. And I don't think he was a hockey businessman by any means. But he, like a, a good businessman, he goes to the best team and says, I want his talent. I want his head scout. So he offered Gary the general manager job. So picture Gary Young thinking, hmm, I love the Bruins. I want to be with the Bruins but I can be the general manager of an NHL hockey team with him, you know, so he had no choice but to go. Um, but that was a tough ship that he got on. So California had always kind of struggled. They weren't a real strong team. But to try to work for an owner like Charlie Finley, I, 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 I'll, I'll give you one anecdote. Basically, Charlie Finley was in uh, Chicago. So when he'd get up in the morning, he'd call his, his general manager. A two-hour time change. And Finley probably got up at 6 in the morning. Right. So there's one instance where Gary Young was, holy cow, what's going on here? Uh, difficult position to be in. And, again, backdrop. 
I think Carol Vadney, who was the, easily the best player with California, said, um, you know, I've been here, I'm doing the work for you, I'm doing all I can, but I'm kind of getting tired of carrying the whole load. I'm ready to go, I'm ready to get out of here. So that puts the general manager in a tough position when your coach and when your best player says, uh, it's time for me to leave. So now Gary's got to go around and try to get the best deal possible. Um, anyway, there's kind of the oddity of Gary and having, you know, uh, picked me in previous time that he would go to the, the brew and say, wait a minute, I know these guys. I scouted them all. And he knew what a great player Reggie was. And he knew what a strong player that Bobby Stewart was, both as a hockey player, but also he added off ice a, a tremendous amount. And his toughness was a factor. that It's tough to put weight on the appropriate weight, but it, it carried a lot. So Gary Young, on paper, got a lot for Carol Vadney. got the best deal possible. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't so... I guess I'm looking at it saying it wasn't so much about me. It was a matter of a lot of natural pieces came together that were, you know, it was coincidental that I would be uh, in the position where Bobby or where Gary had to uh, make that kind of trade. The bottom line, it was horrible. <laughs> and then 11 guys, you know, that's when the WHA started up. Right. And I'm loyal to Gary Young, of course. And uh, 11 other guys weren't. So <laughs> to lose 11 guys off an NHL team when you're already not in the playoffs, can you imagine what that was like? Oh, I know. Boy, if you think back, uh, the players that you lost in one fell swoop, uh, I can't remember all of them, but Bobby Sheehan, Wayne Carlton, Paul Schmier, Jerry Pinder, Gary Jarrett, Gary Kurt. Uh, absolutely, as you said, the team that... Uh, the 71, Gary Young did a good job, uh, along with Bill Torrey there, putting together a real good nucleus of a, of, a, of a young team in California. And they had the, you actually, the, we had Jill Malash in goal, so things looked promising going forward. But as you noted, you lose 11 guys in one shot, and all of a sudden the team is decimated, and you're, you're not back to square one. You're back to somewhere in the negatives because that's impossible to overcome. That had to be very jarring for you compared to what you had become accustomed to in Boston. It was the opposite end of the earth, yeah. Uh, but I, I have to admire, you know, you, you know your stuff. It's incredible, <laughs> oh. what you just said. I mean, you painted the picture better than I did. There, I could. Um, and especially a guy like Gio Malas, just a great goaltender. And looking back, Gary Young put together a heck of a team that every time he added a part, it, it seemed to fit uh, until it fell apart. And uh, um, it's a sad story because I, I have a lot of respect for Gary. He's passed on. Uh, but I, I've always argued that he did a, a tremendous job in a very difficult circumstance and should have, could have, had a, a team to be very, very proud of. On the other hand, the way it worked out, I think the one fell out, there's a book out that argues that the California Seals were the worst team in the history of hockey. <laughs> hard to argue with them. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's hard. Boy, I, I'll tell you, I had a conversation actually with Randy Maneri. We were talking about the other factor you had to deal with, too, with those road trips, uh, You know, the excruciating road trips across uh, the U.S. and connecting flights, and then you you come in and you got you've got you know you're the Bruins, the Canadians, the Flyers, and East Coast swing uh, overall. But your stay there ends at the conclusion. I, I did have one question to ask you, Rick, about that, and uh, that was any you you had the green suitcases, you had the white skates, and did did, did the opposition ever uh, needle you guys on the ice about having to wear those white skates? <laughs> I think we needled each other. I mean, we were looking at each other. And it was, and, and you're right, the suitcases were too much. The, the white skates were tough to comprehend, but because the Oakland A's did it with their white sho shoes and all that, yeah, well, yeah, well, I guess you can kind of understand it. But the low point was the suitcase. It was this great big honk and looked almost like a trunk. And it was Kelly Green or Charlie Finley Green, the same colors as the Oakland A's, and this yellow outline on it and plastic. And it was the guys were so embarrassed when we'd land in the airport They'd go get, at the time, I think they were called red caps, but they would go and get a fella and have him pick up the bag and put him <laughs> on the bus because we were too embarrassed to carry it through the airport. Um, so that experience for you comes to an end 
in a very memorable one begins. You're offered a six-figure contract to join the World Hockey Association's Minnesota Fighting Saints. Now, Harry Neal is the coach there eventually. I think he might have been the coach there that year starting. And had you, I remember reading somewhere, and I may be misspoken here, may be mistaken. Had you known Harry as, as a kid growing up? Uh, was he like a phys ed teacher or something? Yeah, he was my grade 12 oh, phys wow. ed teacher. I'm glad I was uh, right. Absolutely incredible. And how, and how you are good. Oh. Uh, but, uh, I read that. The, I, used, I, used, I used to, you know, I, I, somebody, I think Jordy Douglas, I talked to recently. But how do you know all this stuff? And I said, well, in high school, I did a lot of reading, all of it, the hockey news and hockey books. Uh, unfortunately, wow. not, 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 not much of uh, things that were going to be <laughs> pursued, yeah. advancing my education. So uh, well, I'm, I glad I, I'm glad I remember that about Harry. That, that's a rare story. I'm really impressed, to be honest. But uh, he was a fifth ed teacher, and he wouldn't give us an inch. Here we are playing junior hockey, and he wanted us to do the monkey flip or the monkey. Uh, you, you get on the high bar, and you do a 360 on it. <laughs> I say, <"Are> you crazy. <laughs> And he said, well, you want to get a grade? I never did do it. But uh, uh, but as a coach, he had a funny guy. I mean, he had a career as an announcer in the Canadian television, but uh, a marvelous announcer. He was a color guy and yes. uh, uh, Hall of Famer by all means in that, in that uh, position. As a coach, um, he was kind of an interesting guy. He was kind of like the, the new academic type of coach. Um, old-time hockey. He was a great hockey player. Played for John Marlboro's captain of the team. And uh, in most cases, a player like him would have gone on to have a, a very good minor league career and probably play in the NHL. But for whatever reasons, he took the, the academic route and uh, wound up uh, coaching college hockey and then winds up uh, through an associate, Glenn Sonmore, to be the uh, coach in, in uh, Minnesota. So it was pretty neat coming, you know, seeing my high school teacher there, but hadn't really known what he'd been involved with the hockey. Mm-hmm. Um, but he had a, uh, quite a job. In the sense, in our first year, Mike Walton came to the team. Right. And uh, tremendous talent. He won the scoring. He, I, I think he and Gordy battled it out. Gordy, I think, missed the last game or two, Gordy Howe, uh, because of an injury. So Mike Walton won the scoring championship for the WHA. Yeah, Mike went uh, on a, you probably remember, Mike went on a, a scoring tear. I don't remember the exact stats, but he got hot that year at, at one stretch. It was unbelievable. Scoring like two goals a game for a while. And as you said, won the scoring title, and he was a former Bruin, so of course you were familiar with him. But as uh, we've, uh, as we know, a very, very colorful and unique character in hockey. Very much so. Yeah, and that's what the WHA needed. It needed a star, Bobby Hall, Gordy Howe. These guys drew people into the building. And uh, Shaky, I don't think he broke a sweat. He'd, he'd get two or three, two, like five points, and. Uh, there was nothing to it. Um, in my case, I struggled a little bit because there was this overbalance that they kind of said, he is our God uh, in the sense that uh, he's bringing people to the building, he's bringing people to the league, we're going to do whatever he wants. Right. And um, as a defenseman, I kind of wanted to see him in our end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I said to a guy McNichols, uh, Nichols, uh, Bernie Nichols. One time we were playing with him, and he was at the far end of the ice all the time. And I said, um, Bernie, you ever think about playing defense? And he says, uh, Defense, defense. That's someone who goes around the house, right? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So uh, anyway, but Shaky was, as I say, a great player. Um, but it was really a lopsided lean in the in the uh, for the team as a whole. Um, so that, I would say that I, I enjoyed playing with the Minnesota Fight, Fighting Saints and the team for the three years, and, and we had some really good runs. Yes. And in credit to Shakey, he got us into the, some of the, the games or the playoffs. Or, we did well many times because of Shakey. Um, as I say, there were times when I, <laughs> when, I, when I could have asked him to do a little bit of it our end. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we had a heck of a run, and in Canada they made a like the CBC's our our national TV, uh, but they made a special movie, the Gordy Howe movie. I don't know, have you ever seen that one? I sure have. It was co-produced by uh, Howard Baldwin, who I was working with at the time. But yeah, saw that Hallmark movie and um, a lot of uh, Fighting Saints in- included in that one. 
as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I loved the movie, but it was it was about the year that Gordy came back, and that was my first show at WHA, and we played them in the playoffs. It was just incredible. We had we had a seventeen thousand brand new building, St. Paul Civic Center, and here we are in this new league, and we're selling out playing against Gordy Howe. Wow, right. I mean, we hit the big top right away. And again, credit to Shaky because uh, um, he was our scoring machine. Uh, but it, heartbreaking too, because I mean, it was, it was very, very close. And uh, Gordy probably made the difference in the, in the series, really. Uh, but we were good enough to win that ch- the championship of that league. Uh, so that's pretty exciting when you go to a new league and all this. I mean, we all felt like a bunch of cowboys because <laughs> we were the, you know, we were the bad guys that left the uh, the traditional NHL and kind of like you're on your own here, you know, and mm-hmm. you don't know if you're going to have a team next year. So tremendous success, especially in that first year. Um, and as exciting as you can be. Uh, in game six, the Nets with this, uh, you know, the movie, Gordy's movie showed so well that uh, we thought we were, we thought we could beat them. And there was a strange circumstance in, in, uh, um, game six, but uh, I have. Can I can I take a little bit of a, a, a just a diversion? And tell the story. I hope I'll tell it. I'll try to tell it. Tell no, it it's fine, Rick. You we're uh, every. It's very fascinating to me and to our audience as well. As I told you when we had talked, we have such a large contingent of WHA fans who who listen. In addition to Bruins fans and NHL fans in general. So yeah, fire away. Okay, so Goldie Goldthorpe was a very scary player. And he wasn't part of the team. Our, our, we had one tough guy. His name was Gordy Gallant. And he was at 5'11", and he fought everybody in the league. And he was, he was the heart and soul. But he, was our, he was our guy. If there's a fight, he's doing it. So Ben Sommer here and Neil recognized we needed a little bit more firepower in that end. Um, so they picked up Goldie Goldthorpe, who in the movie, I, I, I know we'll talk about the movie, but in Slapshot, Goldie Goldthorpe was uh, Olgie Oglethorpe. And Goldie was, it was a very good characterization. <laughs> characterization. Uh, and in fact, there's a book, I understand that he's having a book release, I'm going to go to it, in Ottawa, um, April 11th, I think. But it's the Goldie Goldthorpe story, uh, which should be interest, interesting reading. But in particular... So, because Houston were a real tough team, they had a bunch of tough guys, and uh, John Shell in particular. And in this in this game, game six, our barn, they're up three two. We got to win. Um, Shaky goes around the net, comes around the far side of the net. All of a sudden, he drops a stick and gloves, and he goes after uh, John Shell. And so there's this kind of a little burst of fighting, and but where would it come from? It was just out of the blue, and. Uh, they kicked Shaky out of the game. So this was, I think it was the third period, but we're down maybe a goal, and uh, they sent Shaky out in, 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 in you know, glass boards, and, and the only building with glass boards. Mm-hmm. So Shaky, Shaky skated the length of the building, the doors, you know, the Zamboni doors open up. He, he skated out, and, and he disappeared. He's gone. <laughs> like that's, that's gone guy. He's gone. They kicked him out of the game because he went kind of nuts. Mm-hmm. And uh, John Chella goes to the penalty box, and we're still trying to figure out what's going on. It turned out later, by the way, when he was going around the net, and Gordy clipped him. Oh. He gave him a, took him one across the eye. Shaky thought it was John Chella, so he went after the wrong guy. Oh, okay. Maybe he went after the right guy when you think about it. <laughs> right, <laughs> like, exactly. Don't go, don't go after Gordy. Exactly. So, uh, anyway, so uh, Harry Neal sends Goldie Goldthorpe over to the penalty box to serve the penalty. You know, we're still in the game. We get, We can win this thing. We've Unfortunately, we lost our best player, but uh, we're still, you know, we're gonna, we're not giving up. We're still in it. Then we're kind of thinking, oh, by the way, here comes our newly acquired. They acquired him like two, I think, I think within two or three weeks, maybe, maybe four weeks max, we had him on the team. But we knew why we had him. So he goes over the penalty box, and he's serving the penalty. So when the penalty is over, Goldie jumps over the boards, and now we're all watching. But we noticed he didn't have his stick or his gloves. <laughs> so he goes and gets Sean Shella, and he jumps on him, and they kind of wrestle around and everything. But we were kind of surprised. We kind of thought that more would happen. Well, after the game, Goldie mentioned that, well, I'm a pretty good friend of John Shella. I'm not, you know, I'm not going <laughs> to hurt him. 
So that's, that's kind of the, the that's funny. most it's, of the most of the story. But the, he's in another layer. So now I wake up in the morning and listen to my favorite country western music star station. And the local guy says, uh, "Hey, we got Goldie Goldthorpe. We're going to interview him in a half an hour. He's in doing a special signing." So Goldie is still going to various rinks. Or he's on the circuit, and he's got T-shirts. And he's still making a living on not making a living. I shouldn't say that. Goldie's doing very well and representing the game um, and its history. Uh, and he signs autographs, takes pictures, T-shirts, which is great. I'm, I'm happy as can be for him. So, and again, a teammate. So I'm thinking, i got to call the radio station and tell the announcer to ask him about this story. So I didn't tell who the, I know the guy, Big G we call him, but I, I didn't tell him who it was. I just relay the stories I have now. And uh, I said, uh, ask, Gordy, ask Goldie about it when you're, you know, when you're interviewing him. So sure enough, I'm listening, but half an hour later, they're interviewing Goldie. And Big G tells the story just like I've told it. And Goldie said, yeah, yeah, but it wasn't my fault. All of a sudden, I'm listening. I kind of was lying in the bed listening to it. Popped up, and I'm like, what do you mean it wasn't your fault? <laughs> and he said, Harry Neal told me to leave my stick in the gloves <laughs> in the belly box. That's funny. They never, the things that people could never envision happening these days, the, the, just insane story. I wonder if that's, I wonder if that's the same game that Michael Walton left the arena in full uniform and went out. That's the game. Uh, <laughs> that's the game. I omitted the part of where he went from when he left in full uniform. He had his Mark IV parked. Probably we, we could probably see it <laughs> you know, as we looked down the ice. <laughs> Jumped in the Mark IV and uh, drove to the nearest pub. You can imagine being in that pub, just seeing a fully, uh, fully uniformed yeah. Mike Walton yeah. walking in while the game is going on. Um, yeah, and St. Paul's a little town, right? I mean, it, it's like a, it's like a Boston, it's a one tenth of the size, but the heart of Boston is just like St. Paul. Right now, you talked about the uh, addition of Goldie Goldthorpe that year, and hockey's changing, obviously, at that time. But it's gone, you know, from uh, the Philadelphia Flyers the year before won the Stanley Cup, so a lot of toughness coming in. So seventy four, seventy five. First of all. Well, we'll go into 74, 75 for a moment here, but you've got guys like Kurt Brackenberry, Gordy Gallant, uh, the Carlsons are on the scene, uh, Bill Butters, just an incredibly tough and colorful team uh, that you've got, and you uh, end up having the brawl in the mall in Hartford, near and dear to uh, us uh, Whaler people. Uh, do you have a recollection of that uh, That night? ends up with... Uh, Nick Fatio and Jack Carlson going uh, toe to toe, but uh, do you remember that brawl in particularly in Hartford? Oh, I, I now I can't remember all the details because it was just all over the place. They just kept going and going another one, another one. It was uh, um, but the part that I remember, I, I have to uh, public thank you to uh, Fred O'Donnell, a uh, very very tough Bruin uh, who had gone to Hartford, and we knew each other from the summer. We, we did kind of play hockey a little bit together. We we didn't know each other real well, but we we're a friendly sort of thing. Um, anyway, we had a, a there was a a bit of a thing going on, and I Ellen Hing Slavin and I had kind of a little tussle, and um, it, it worked out that I was on top sort of thing. So anyway, Nikki Fotio come over and grab me, and oh. uh, thinking, okay, I'll take care of you sort of thing. And <laughs> Freddie O'Donnell came by and says to Nikki, Nikki, I'll take care of him. Oh, <laughs> right? perfect. So Freddie grabbed me. <laughs> Saved my life. Um, but then we had a deal. That, uh, and this went on and on and on. As you know, a very, very famous brawl. But uh, every time we had a deal, if, if his guy was down, I'd let him go and, and at least make it even. Similarly, if my guy was down, I'd go over and kind of get them back straight up with each other to keep fighting, but not allowing anybody to get beat up or make sure that the guy on top got off of being on top and, right. and trying to just save each other's teammate. But I uh, sure appreciate it. I thank Freddie every time I say we see, he's here in Kingston, so uh, I see him a lot and a uh, great player and a great fellow. Absolutely. Another uh, ex-Bruin as well. Uh, Rick, prior to that season, and I appreciate you going a little bit over time here for us, and I, I appreciate it. I wanted to talk to you very, very quickly about the you joined the WHA. You have a good, strong first season. That leads to playing for Team Canada in 1974 with a lot of hockey legends. You talked about Jerry Cheevers and uh, Bobby Hall and Gordie Howe. Uh, you guys play 
you don't win the series, obviously. You only win uh, one or two games, but it's pretty competitive. You're battling hard, and you have an older team, and the, 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 the Russians obviously are ready for you after what happened in 72. Can you just give me an overview of what that experience was like for yourself playing against those with and against those uh, great players in the Summit Series of 74? It's it's a hard question to answer because it's it's I hate to do a comparative sort of thing relative to you know this team or that team, but there's nothing like playing for your country to mm-hmm. start with. So when you're on Team Canada and two years previous, Team Canada '72 won a last minute, un, most unbelievable series. It is the hockey event of the history of hockey for Canadians. Right. So you know what Miracle on Ice in '80 and Jack McCartan in 1960 and every hockey series you can think of wrap them up and that might be close to what Team Canada 72 Russia series was uh, for Canadians. Right. So to be the next team to come along alone, it was such an honor to be involved with it. A side note there is the reason I was picked for the team was quite simple. They went to Jerry Cheevers, who was the best goalie in the league, obviously going to be the, the, the goalie for Team Canada. Then they said, who do you want on defense? And Jerry Cheevers said myself and Paul Schmier and obvious guys like uh, Pat Stapleton and uh, J.C. Trombley, mm-hmm. um, two other great players, uh, Ricky Lee and uh, Brad Selwood. But to be picked by your goalie, and as I say, the thread in my life of Jer- Jerry Cheevers in my life from day one, from tra- <laughs> from the full lounge mm-hmm. to Team Canada 74 to coming back to the Bruins, again, Jerry Cheevers was a central figure. Uh, but in particular with 74, I was there, but I was there because of Jerry Cheever saying, I want you on as a defenseman. So that alone is just you're in the clouds with respect to, well, what am I, this is, in, what, a, what a thrill, what a, is this ever scary? One of the guys said, Canada's with us, win or tie. <laughs> <laughs> so there was pressure. And again, now we're representing our WHA, which is a fledgling league, a bunch of renegades, a bunch of rebels and all that sort of thing. But it's business, and there's a lot of money on the line because we're a new league that still hasn't made it over the top. Um, some teams are folding, uh, but you're representing your whole league. in more, So now you're representing your country, your league, and Jerry Cheevers. Uh, <laughs> right. But so... It was it was a tremendous thing to be involved with, as exciting as you can imagine. Uh, you can't even do a comparative relative to to uh, uh, the the '70s Bruins or, or the late '70s Don Cherry's Bruins. All incredible experiences, unique by itself. Um, but I mean, this is your country. This is and this is the communism and mm-hmm. uh, you know all the political and it was very political. Uh, anyway, um, getting to the point, we had a great game in, in uh, Quebec to start it off, and we didn't know really what to expect. We knew they were good. We didn't know how good they were. Um, but we were tied 3-3, and Gordie Howe stripped the defenseman, gave, basically gave the, the defenseman a chop on his hands, took the puck, handed it to Frank Mahovlich, and Frank Mahovlich is going in clear from the blue line on Trechak, and I think he got a glove save or blocker, got hit with a blocker. But we could have easily won game one. Mm-hmm. And we knew we played with them and good enough to win. Now we go to Toronto, and again, we're a little, we're feeling better, we've got a bit of confidence, unsure, but we had a big game in, in Toronto, and we won, I think, 5-2 or whatever the score was. It wasn't a, it wasn't a squeaker. Mm-hmm. We, we deserved to win the game. And now we don't know how good we are. We don't know how bad we are. We don't know how good they really are. You know, are they are they playing possum? What's going on here? So we go to Winnipeg. But a unique, again, situation, which I don't know that you'll hear about very often in sport. But one of the things that the management said to the team was that, okay, if you come in the team, we'll play everybody. Because right. in 72, they had this problem where the guys re- rebelled. Some of the guys left the team because they weren't playing. So to get by that assurance, everybody, you'll get to play. Now we're up the game, things are going good. So first thing is they put in the tier two players, if you will. Let's put it, they, 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 they put the players in that 
didn't get picked for the first game. Right. And we had lots of players. Second thing was Jerry Cheever's father, father-in-law, I'm pretty sure I, who it was exactly, but a family member had a heart attack. Right, father-in-law. The, yeah. Yeah, father-in-law, right? So, so Cheesy, it was, not, it was natural for him not to play because I think he, whatever, they, they went with uh, two parts, right? Promised to play the guys, and Cheesy, I think, was probably involved with the funeral. So we went with our, our backup goalie, uh, McLeod, Smokey McLeod, mm-hmm. who was a good goalie, but not a great goalie. I mean, when you think of 72, they took Dryden and Antonio to play a, the best games of their lives to win. Right. So it was kind of a combination of everything. But the problem was we were went way down. And it was, uh, I forget the score, but it, it, we weren't even close in the game. So go to game four. Now what do we got? We got a great start. We got to go up, down. Now it looks like a little bit of a yo-yo. But the cards are on the line in Vancouver. And Billy Harris, our coach, who's a great hockey player in the 70s with the Leafs, so it was the best hockey, best period of hockey that he'd ever seen. And Gordy Howe, I think Bobby Hall got three. Yes. Gordy and Frank scored. So, and I'm not absolutely sure of that. I think I'm pretty sure of Bobby getting a three, and I'm pretty sure of Gordy, and I'm pretty sure. Anyway, bottom mm-hmm. line, we get five, right, in the first period. And holy mackerel, we got it back again. This is fantastic, but that's when and you, and you look. You know, you talk about the game in uh, in seventy one and, and the double overtime loss in seventy nine. Whatever happens, that for some reason it doesn't work, mm-hmm. and the Russians played outstandingly well, uh, but they tied us. You know, you could say that's a moral victory that we left Canada tied, but we thought we could have won three so where are you mentally you're going to russia bad news well we you know so we were kind of all over the place but the essence of the story is we take a week in finland and in sweden and played some exhibition games and instead of our team coming together and playing better as they did in 72 we took a dip right and bobby hall made the statement that the worst thing we did was to go on and spend that week I mean, there was no, it wasn't a thing you could plan around. You kind of had to do it with all the logistics. Yeah. But Bobby's point, I agree with Bobby, is that if we just kept it going, you know, we were going good. We were, we had a, a great momentum. Um, theoretically, we could have done much better in Russia. And even there, uh, Bobby argues that, and I agree with him, that I think it was game two. Uh, we thought we tied it. I think there was a, supposedly it was the end of the game. I've kind of got vague memories of that, unfortunately. And I, I've got the tapes, but I don't like watching them. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, well, they were a great team, deserved to win, no question. Um, but disappointing, and we felt we could have done better. You begin the 75-76 uh, Minnesota Fighting Saints. You reunite with Johnny McKenzie. Dave Keon joins the Minnesota Fighting Saints, already a strong team, now is that much better. Had this conversation with Mike Antonovich recently. You guys were good enough to win a championship that year. You still have Shaky Walton, yourself, your nucleus is there, you add some great players. Young Paul Holmgren joins the team, and financial issues uh, enter the scene, and the team ends up folding in February of that year. Leading up to it is a lot of financial Hardship, a lot of sacrifice on behalf of the players. Mike still says it still burns him because he, that team, he, he felt they you really got the rug pulled out on you. He had a chance to win it all. Uh, looking back at it, you guys are playing for no money in many cases. What was that experience like to uh, the winding down of what could have been a really great franchise? You, I think you put it so well. You set the stage ideally. Um, a, a tremendous team put together. Uh, Pye was still playing great. Davey Keon at 40, you know, when we heard that he was coming, I thought, well, you know, like, maybe he's a little bit old, but he was sensational. Right. Um, the, 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 the players were excellent, had everything to, easily to win, but the instability, and they're kind of, again, different parts of the story, but previous the previous year, um, we'd, we were owned by a 
and initially when I went there, it was a bunch of businessmen that threw like 25,000 in the pod and owned a, a hockey team. Um, but they sold to third generation 3M family. And uh, I wish I could remember the fellow's name, uh, but uh, just a really nice man. Was and, it uh, Wayne Belial? No, he was the re- he was the lawyer representing the, the limited partnership. Mm-hmm. You know, so he was kind of the the, uh, the front man, if you would. I don't think he had very much money in, but he represented this third generation 3M. Mm-hmm. And I do apologize because the man was such a nice person, and he got his his family involved. Um, and he, he in the in the series, my second year we played Quebec. He was so nervous he couldn't watch the games. All oh, right. And he did so much for us as a group. And if you ever wanted to win for a, an owner, he was the guy. Um, but then that summer, um, they ran out of money. And even though the third generation 3M, I guess was second. I might not be totally accurate, but my understanding was. The owner of the Minnesota North Stars was the second generation, oh. and the name I remember was Smokey Ordway, and I guess they froze the money. It was a trust account. They were paying us out of a, the 3M trust account, mm-hmm. and this maybe not be might be totally accurate, but the essence was there <clears throat> that our rich owners, <clears throat> third generation uh, 3M, couldn't get at the money, so they were in a bind. Then. The family members kind of at a meeting and said, you know, we're losing money here. And we're not as excited about hockey as we were, so we're out. So here's our owner trying to maintain it on his own. And it was kind of heartbreaking for us, just for him. Because they, as I say, yeah, there was another fellow by the name of Forbes, I think a brother-in-law or something. But he went with us in Team Canada 74. But my point being, it was a family that I've never felt so much of a, a a connection to ownership that you felt when you lost you felt bad that you didn't that you let our own, the owner down mm-hmm. um, so when that transpired then all kinds of things were going on you'd hear about it every day but bottom line we knew early on that it would find it, there was no financial stability it's even at the point where you know it was the end of my career my career my, it could have been the end of my career but uh it was, you know, he started thinking about next year and negotiating mm-hmm. and all that sort of thing. Well, the Saints, we can't negotiate with you. You know, we, we, <laughs> we, have, nice. we can't make the next payroll, so we're not going to worry about next year with you. Mm-hmm. Um, so everybody was kind of thrown off. And But I can remember a number of team meetings when everybody really had despair. And, you know, going to the airport and uh, wondering whether you're going to get on the plane because they're going to deliver the envelope there's a check, and I, one of the anecdotes is I can remember one of the players, it was like he got the check in his hand at the airport, gave it to his wife, and his wife raced to the bank because she wanted to be one of the first, you know, figure, they're not going to cash them all. Um, but it, under, it undermined the situation uh, pretty badly. Um, yeah, it's it's odd. Uh, looking back, I mean, I, I enjoyed my experience with the Minnesota Fighting Saints so much, and... You know, when you think about the teams, the the big bad Bruins, uh, the, we've talked about that, uh, Don Cherry's Bruins in Boston, but that Minnesota Fighting Saints team was unique, obviously with the with the Hansons and the Carlsons and mm-hmm. the, all the guys and the various stories. Uh, one, I, I've got to just throw in a quick anecdote with it. Mm-hmm. Um, again, the Jerry Cheever story. We were playing in their first game with, with of the year with Davey. And uh, there was a brawl, of course. Uh, I think the one of the, the uh, Carl suckered one of their guys, Jimmy Harrison, I think it was, and mm-hmm. all the brawl breaking and fighting all over the place. And Jerry went over to Dave Keenan and said, "Davey, how do you like the WHA so far?" <laughs> <laughs> and Dave says, "Ah, oh, you kidding? This is nothing. You should have seen training camp." <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> we That's, had a, uh... Have you ever heard about the game in Mankato? Oh, uh, was that there was a game where? Uh... Mike Walton got his nose rearranged a little bit. Yeah, in the that? first shift. Yeah, and Dave Keon as well. Yeah, one one had a, a, a nose broken and the other a cut over their eye in the mm-hmm. first shift. <laughs> what they did, they, we had, you you named all the guys and plus another twenty guys, and uh, they were the Johnstown Jets, um, and a real team. Uh, anyway, bottom line, uh, we're, we all go on a bus. 
from Minnesota, St. Paul, up to Mankato, which nobody knew where that was. Right. But it's a friendly thing. You know, it's training camp, and we're going to maybe get to, we're probably thinking about having a beer on the way up sort of thing. Right. Um, so we get to the rink, and then we go to different dress rooms. And we lo- I looked around the dress room, and I hmm, gee. There's, you know, um, Gary Gambucci and Teddy Hampson and Wayne Connolly and, you know, uh, all the guys like me, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> Dave Keehan and Mike Walton. Mm-hmm. All the, if, the, let's put it this way, the, you might say the non-combative types. <laughs> and where are the other guys? Well, they're in the other room. Well, they went into the, Glenn Sonmore and Harry Neal went in the other room and said, hey, this is the last chance you've got to impress us. Did you remember Slapshot? Sure do. Remember in Slapshot, they're in the final game, mm-hmm. and you know, now all of a sudden, the scouts are out there. we got to impress right. them. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you, that game was worse than Slapshot. Right. Real, real life. People often say that at that era, at that time in hockey, uh, and you had it firsthand because you had the essence of Slapshot with the Carlson slash Hansons with you. Um and the real life was more unbelievable than the movie could ever ever be at that point. Yeah, I think they they thought they, we can't you know we we can't paint it that bad. Nobody will believe us. <laughs> the uh, the Saints fold. You return to the National Hockey League. Ble- brief stop with the St. Louis Blues, reuniting with Derek Sanderson briefly. But uh, another very unique thing happens in your career. You have end up with so many, as you said, colorful and, and close teams, but you end up coming back to Boston with the Lunch Pail Bruins and that team. Uh, people forget you know, uh, that you lost. The Boston Bruins in 1975 lost the greatest player in the history of the sport, yet the Bruins continued to do well. They added Rick Middleton, Peter McNabb, uh, Jerry Cheever's return from the WHA, and then uh, you come over from the St. Louis Blues, and the team has tremendous success through the 70s. And again, we've gone a little bit long, and I greatly appreciate it. Uh, but I, I want to ask you, just in general, playing for Don Cherry, it's a little different experience now for you because the Bruins of the early 70s, a different uh, mix than the Bruins of the late 70s. That late 70s team, I think, sometimes gets underappreciated because of the greatness of the Montreal Canadiens, et cetera, et cetera. What was that experience like playing with uh, that group of Bruins on your second go-around uh, in Boston? Well, it was the best part of my career. Um, we've talked about family and uh, team. Uh, Don was incredible at building that feeling. And, you know, we're referred to as the lunch bucket gang. Uh, probably the best hockey that I played in my, in my career was through that span playing for Don. Uh, and the team was, there was a, we were all, we were, it's, it's hard to, I always get in trouble when I want to talk about early versus late uh, 70s Bruins. But, the, because of Don, he, everybody was kind of all in the mix. We were all, I mean, he was our leader, um, and we were we were like uh, 18 family members that were all brothers and sisters, or well, brothers, but, you know, we're, there wasn't a favorite brother, or that, that's not the right word, but th- there was a sense of um, more evenness throughout. And, and the, way I can, the reason I can say that is that when you play in a team with Bobby Orr, he is a god. He is the best hockey player ever in hockey. So naturally, he's going to be way up there. Mm-hmm. And similarly, Phil Esposito, a great player, and he was way up there. So it was, if you will, it was a little bit more of a vertical type of thing. Whereas with the Bruins of, of Don Cherry, it was if you think of more of a, of a, a horizontal type lineup, there mm-hmm. were definitely... If it was a spectrum, there was it went from uh, you know white to black uh, in the sense that you know we had some play. Matter of fact, Don Cherry's got a great line and that diverge a little bit here. But uh, <laughs> one time he came in and he said, "Now you guys, you know that everybody thinks they're going to be treated equal in hockey, right?" And of course, yeah, we have that's one of the things. Yeah, we treat everybody equally in a team. Yeah, it's just a given. He says, well, and you know we don't do that, right? <laughs> he says, you know I'm going to treat John Rattel and Brad Park better than Rick Smith or some other piece of hamburger. You know that, right? They get that, right? Let's just set the stage here. <laughs> and he said it so perfectly that, yeah, by all means. But 
as I say, it was more of a horizontal grid versus, um, you know, Rick Smith, the fifth defenseman on the Boston Ruins, isn't going to be, <laughs> you know, Bobby is such a great person. They were so, and uh, uh, Chief and all the guys, they they deserve to be in in the highest of stature. Mm-hmm. So anyway, getting back to my, I don't know if that worked or not, but the point is that playing in a team with Don Cherry's Bruins and, and the Lunch Pail Gang, everybody felt, if you know, think about the, if, uh, we've got the rope pull, you know, where you, the tug of war, right? Mm-hmm. You know, when you're in a tug of war, and I haven't done it, maybe done one in my life, but the feeling when you're in a tug of war, you feel like you're pulling on that rope equally with everybody in the rope, in the line. Right. Okay? So, mentally, that team, I, I felt more in the middle of or or something like that. Yeah. But I think that everybody in the team felt right at the heart of the team. And maybe some of my words aren't appropriate. I, I don't mean to mm-hmm. uh, say it's a tough question to compare the two. But as I look back, the years with Don and, uh, and it, you know, we did extremely well. Yes. Uh, but there was a bit of a surprise factor in there. You know, we beat some pretty good teams and in particular we beat the Flyers out two years in a row, I think, mm-hmm. that, boy, they could have won the Stanley Cup easily. Right. So every we had to claw and scratch for every inch we got. Um, and meeting Montreal that at the end, and, and we've talked, uh, funny how Montreal keeps popping up here, yeah. but uh, can imagine losing five years in the playoffs to the Montreal Canadiens? Right. Yeah, yeah so, I witnessed, they, they, witnessed yeah. many of those and... Yeah. Of course, the the last one being the most uh, upsetting, but again, those were in that time period uh, when you're you're talking about this part of your career. Let's say sixty eight to seventy nine. That stretch, only three teams won the cup: the Bruins, the Flyers, and the Canadians. Tough to do, and the Canadian team was icing uh, seven or eight Hall of Fame players. The Bruins. They talked about this with uh, with Rick Middleton a lot, and. You guys were good, and maybe just a player away or whatever, but just the Canadian team was incomparably good, winning four straight cups. But that Bruins team was outstanding, night in and night out, season in and season out, always at the top, top two or three teams in the league. Uh, just couldn't quite uh, get over the top. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and as you look back, total respect for the Montreal Canadiens. But if, if the... <laughs> It was almost like the hockey gods didn't want this to happen mm-hmm. because we we deserve to win at least one. Right. And the game in in uh, the overtime game, double overtime, by all means, we should have won that game. And uh, you could live it a replay it a million times, and uh, probably probably the same thing happened. But in our hearts, we felt that we were Stanley Cup champions, and I think as a team we were. Uh, and for three years running there, so uh, when you look back on on those teams. Uh, just very, very uh, fond memories of it, and uh, uh, I, lucky in my eyes, I kind of sit here, rem, you know, trying to figure it out. Just plain lucky to be involved with either, but to have been involved with both those Bruin teams, uh, kind of out of out of this world thinking. You know, when you think of a of a career, to be to spend eight years with those teams. It's just uh, it, it's a it's a dream come true, and uh, I'm pinching myself as we speak. Yeah, and not too many players had a chance to do what you did, playing for both eras, uh, yourself and uh, Wayne Cash and Jerry Cheevers, uh, Don Marcotte, but to actually go stretch it out uh, to both. Um, your career concludes, and you brief stop in, in Detroit and Washington, but. Uh, I'm curious about now. You, I know you went to get your computer science degree, went back to school. I ask guys this all the time. We talked, had this conversation with Randy Maneri in, in the last one. That first September, October of whatever year it was, 81, 82, when you're not playing, uh, after doing this for almost 20 years previous to that, what is that like? And a lot of guys struggled with their identity, struggled with that transition. How was that for you? Um, yeah, good point, because I uh, really didn't know I, 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 and when it was over for me, I knew it was over. They kind of made it pretty clear. Mm-hmm. When you're sitting up in the roof watching the game, you think, hmm, maybe it's over. <laughs> uh, but I was happy to to retire at the point I did. Uh, our son Dustin was born. 
But I'd always wanted to come back to where we live now, this little lake north of Kingston, Ontario. And uh, mentally I was ready for the change, yet I didn't really know what was going to happen to the change. So I was kind of going along happily and just looking around and enjoying myself, uh, but not doing much. And, I, I, you know, the idea of a sabbatical. Uh, but I, I had made a point to say, okay, I'm going to take a year and not think about it, not worry about it, or where am I going to go from here, but just to t- let it kind of land, you know, get your feet in the ground mm-hmm. a little bit. Um, and I, maybe I got a little bit too lazy because I'm kind of just, you know, not doing much and just enjoying life too much, too long a vacation, if you will. <laughs> um, but uh, and, and I, and the other thing that's kind of a phenomenon is that many hockey players, when they leave the game, they want to leave it completely. Right. Like they don't take half a step out the door, they take a full step out. And they don't want to be involved with um, old-timer hockey or the, the team. Like, you've left the team, leave it behind, look ahead, what's your future sort of thing. And in my case, I was saying, yeah, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? Um, but it, you know, well, the various things, of we're working around the land or whatever, or the cottage, or maybe enjoying myself too much. But my dad came to me and said, uh, so what are you going to do for the rest of your life? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I was thinking about computers. I understand they're going to be a big part of our life in the future. I think I might look into that. Mm-hmm. And so the, he, by chance, got a contact for me through our, uh, a fellow at the uh, Queen, at Queen's University. It's kind of like Harvard of Canada sort of mm-hmm. thing. But a friend of the family came up with a, uh, a program. He told my dad about this program, which is a conversion program that says, I've, I've gone to school in the summers, and I had a degree in biology. So it took uh, people with a, another discipline and made a hybrid. What they were finding with computing people is they couldn't talk to anybody. So right. they wanted to widen the horizon. So my dad got me into this kind of a conversion uh, master's degree in computer science. Uh, it sounded great. I had a nice shortcut. You know, I thought, uh, I don't want to go to school full-time for a long time. I just want to get my degree and get out of here. <laughs> Anyway, so I went back to school um, after a year. I'd kind of just relax, and uh, um, but there I am sitting in, in school with this, you know, these all these twenty-year-old, eighteen to twenty-year-old kids, kids coming up and asking me for an autograph and all that. I'm, oh, geez, where am I? Uh, but they threw all of the undergraduate courses into a package and tried to teach them to us in one year. So imagine with no background and hadn't been going, like I'd gone through a biology degree and that sort of thing. Uh, so all of a sudden, I'm going to be doing mathematical stuff year four in my conversion year. Oh. Well, the point I'm going to make is that, holy cow, I'm way out of my league, and I, I can't do this stuff. Like, I thought I had a, you know, I thought I was, I thought I had some academic ability. Well, I was failing badly. And what a shock to the system that is. So mm-hmm. twofold. One, you've left your, your career, something that's been all your life, and then you kind of looked around, oh, this is a nice life. And now you're going to do this new thing academically and all that sort of thing, and you're failing. What a shocker. So I was lucky. Um, what they, <laughs> in an odd case, I, I was lucky in the sense that they didn't tell me that we don't fail anybody in this program. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but they couldn't tell you before. Mm-hmm. Because if, you, if they told you we weren't going to fail, you're not going to work, right? right? So you work as hard as you can, get as much, inform- as much knowledge with respect to computing, in that conversion year, and then you come back into the graduate program, and then that's when you, you know, you really do some serious learning. So, it was a a three-year process, um, but it wasn't a cinch. You know, as I looked around, uh, oh, boy, looking back, it was a great experience, but in the midst of it, it was like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, we all had that feeling, and you stepped way out of your comfort zone. And yeah. uh, that's very motivational, actually, to hear that because so few people would have the perseverance. It's almost similar, to, like you said, when you went into the Bruins camp. You know, sometimes feeling you were over your head or you wouldn't make it. And um, but again, just taking it one day at a time sounds cliche-ish, but taking your education at that point, and you know, with the combination of biology and computer science, you're kind of ahead of the head of the uh, curve. Uh, in your foresight there about uh, where th- where things were going. So that's quite an accomplishment, uh, equally as impressive as your hockey accomplishments as well. Well, thank you. But the key, just if, you know, inspirational-wise, is to not quit. Mm-hmm. 
you know, it's so easy to say, oh, it's not working, it doesn't work. And the reason I'm kind of getting into this is because every player goes through it in some form. That part where you, when you leave the game, you want to get out of the building. You don't want to drag your feet. But secondly, when you go into this new environment, this new life, boy, oh boy, there's some challenges there that you hadn't anticipated. Mm -hmm. And to be in the NHL, you've, you've had success, you've got confidence, uh, you think you can do a lot of good things, but to fail at anything, no matter whether it's tiddlywinks, you know, if the tiddlywinks are important <laughs> and you're failing, all of a sudden you look around and, and it's so the point being is that there are a lot of hockey players, everybody goes through it, but some hockey players find it difficult and it really is a challenge. So fortunately there's, you know, the NHL alumni, the NHL, uh, there are great support systems, mm -hmm. um, but it, there's, it's a, it's something that, and they're much more aware of it now, and they're preparing people. But when we retired in the, in the early '80s, sort of thing, they were, you know, you're gone, see ya. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, exactly. So, uh, uh, anyway, it's it's something that everybody, and it, it's not just hockey players that change careers. So that anybody that in life, if you have to say, okay, the past is done, now where am I going in the future? It can be a difficult step, and, and bottom line, you got to. I have one quick anecdote within that. Mm -hmm. I I had four out of fifty as a term mark in this one course. Four out of fifty, right? I didn't do very well in the test, <laughs> and uh, you had to have a B average, which was sixty-five. Right. So I did the math, and I knew that I couldn't get <laughs> enough to be get to a B. But that was the other part. My understanding was I had to be a, carry a B average. Um, which is like a 3.0 in U.S. terms. But uh, mm -hmm. anyway, I knew mathematically I was done. So this one, it was integrated circuits. Like this was like, you know, when you connect one wire to the other and you get a zero out of it. But uh, I knew I couldn't do it, so I wasn't going to write the exam. I'd written all the exams I knew what I was going on, but I wasn't going to waste my time wait, wait, on my 4 to 50 thing. And I, I got a close associated with my business partner, a great guy, a great friend, Monty Christie is his name. But he was a teacher at a local college, and he said, Rick, you have to go and write the exam. And I said, why? It's just a waste of time. I'm just going to embarrass myself. I'm going to sit there for three hours and look at the paper. He said, go and write the exam. It doesn't matter. Give your professor a chance to let you win. Give your, chance, give your professor a chance to pass you. Because if you don't hand in a paper, he's got no choice. So sure enough, I went. And lo and behold, so I'll come again, I, I answered a few of the questions. They must have been easy questions. <laughs> and <laughs> but the funny part was the teacher was from Boston. Oh, right? wow. And uh, we talked during the year, but he never, never talked about the Bruins. But just there was this, just kind of a comfortable rapport with the Bob. Well, you know, again, a relatively small class, maybe 30, 40 people in there, whatever. But anyway, he was proctoring an exam, and as I walked out, and it was Christmas time, the last exam before Christmas, he said to me, Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, he knew he was going to pass me before I left the building. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny it's you say that. that. You know, kind of the common threads of what you're, you know, and I find it to be extremely humbling and, and interesting is along the way of your life and your career, post-career, key people show up. You talked about this uh, professor here, Gary Young, Jerry Cheevers, Harry Neal, guys like that just pop up, and you, you can't do it alone in life. You know, you need people, and uh, you were fortunate to have some some great people along the way to uh, recognize your abilities and give you an opportunity where perhaps uh, somebody else may not have. So well said, and I, I can't express uh, the appreciation as uh, so for the people who have done what you said, Wayne Cashman. Uh, I could go on and on. Mm -hmm. But you realize that you know, people around you are so very important. And a, a great uh, a cause, uh, have gotten us to where we are, I guess you would say. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Rick, we really appreciate it. This is officially our longest interview of all time, but I <laughs> had a feeling it might be because every time I talk to you, I find it to be uh, captivating. I could go on for uh, another three or four hours, but I promise you I won't. Um, but I will say thank you so much for spending the time, and we'll look forward to seeing you in May. Uh, you'll be back in the Boston area for Frank Simonetti's 
Bowl with Bruin uh, fundraiser. And that's always a, a great event. And you and your wife have, have been here uh, before for that. And uh, we'll you know, obviously look forward to seeing you there and having a great time. But in the short term, uh, thanks so much for spending uh, all this time with us today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you real soon. Well, thank you very much. And I, I really enjoyed your, uh, as I say, you, you, you know this so well, <laughs> the, the various things we've been through. And uh, you've described it many times much better than I could have ever. Well, I appreciate that, Rick. It's very nice of you to say. And uh, say hello to your uh, lovely bride. And we'll look forward to, to seeing you in a few weeks. Ah, thank you. Thanks, Rick. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast. Be sure to visit us at ProHockeyAlumni.org.